What is up, you guys? Teller checking in for UFC Vegas 76. Got your guys' favorite fighter, Sean Strickland, the number seventh ranked middleweight fighter, uh, taking on uh, Abus Megamadov, relatively a newcomer to the octagon. Uh, in fact, he is for sure. I mean, he only has one fight. Uh, he had a phenomenal finish against Dustin Stolzfus, um, but he's new to the octagon, getting a, a giant opportunity here. Uh, if you know a little bit about Magomedov, you know, fighting over in the PFL for some time, uh, does have a lengthy resume, has a, a good amount of pro fights, and he's a fighter that brings the fight and, and goes out there and looks to get the finish. So this does have the makings of being a very fun fight. Uh, so if you're kind of wondering why the UFC put this fight together, I mean, I guess uh, the middleweight uh, top 10, a little bit funky right now, and they, they give Strickland this fight here. So uh, it is what it is. Um, now, this is a card that I like. There's a lot of... Very talented fighters scattered all throughout this, this card here. Demir Ismagulov taking on Grant Dawson. These are two phenomenal fighters uh, that, that are looking to grow the recognition of their names. But just understand the skill level uh, is very high. Uh, Michael Morales still very young. The undefe undefeated up-and-comer taking on Max Griffin. This is big-time talent here. Is Ismael Bonfim, a very talented Brazilian fighter. You know him and his brother, the Bonfim brothers. Very serious. Bruno Ferreira, uh, a very exciting and fun fighter to watch. Uh, let's see. We got Kevin Lee making his return back to the octagon, taking on Renat Fakradinov. Um, Alexander Romanov versus Blagoy Ivanov. That should be fun. Uh, Guram uh, Kuta, excuse me, this name always gets me here. I mean, Guram Kutata Laziz taking on Elvis Brenner. Uh, Brenner had a big time performance and a short notice fight in his debut, but now he gets uh, Guram, uh, and that's going to be a very, very tough fight for him there. Uh, Joe Anderson Brito also taking on uh, the UFC newcomer who takes the fight on, on short notice in Weston Wilson. I mean, we just talked about a lot of. Uh, very talented fighters that are on the up and up. A lot of exciting fighters. I mean, Brito, all these guys I just talked about. I mean, this is a fun card, okay? So I'm excited to jump into this card. You guys know how we do it here. We're going to be talking about every single fight throughout the card. We'll start at the bottom. We'll work our way up. We have timestamps if you want to jump to any specific fight. A quick side note. I haven't been doing the recaps of these cards like I like to do. I'm kind of working on something behind the scenes. I want to try to do a little bit of a new format. Uh, so, uh, you know, as I'm recording this, uh, I am recording this uh, just before uh, UFC Jacksonville takes place. So I, I can't recap that fight right now, but I'm working on something new. Uh, and I promise you, we will hit, be hitting up all the recaps moving forward. And I know I didn't recap the last episode of The Ultimate Fighter, but I will be recapping this upcoming weeks and we'll do a, a double recap of last week's and this week's episode. You know, so just giving you guys some information there. Please catch me on all my social media. All scrolling below. Please like this video. Let's go jump into the first fight. The Teller. It's another day, yeah. left jab, right jab, this is MMA, MMA. Mixed martial arts, quick body parts, undefeated when I pick a mood of champ Who the victim looking in my crystal ball, I predict the winner yeah. Never stop fighting, if you lose, keep your chin up keep your chin Know up. how the game go, I'm a small fella uh -huh. Welcome to the show, this the MMA fortune teller yeah. The MMA fortune, MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. Joe Anderson Brito will now be taking on Weston Wilson. Uh, Brito was initially supposed to be taking on Hussein Ashkabov, uh, the fighter that was undefeated up until he made his debut uh, against Jamal Emers. Uh, now Joe Anderson Brito will be taking on Weston Wilson. Weston Wilson. Uh, not to be confused with Wes Watson, if you guys are familiar with old Wes, always yelling on the mic ever since they let him out of his cage. Uh, Weston Wilson uh, trains over there with Wonderboy. Uh, he's trained by, by Wonderboy's father, Ray Thompson, uh, training over there in South Carolina. He has the, the karate background. You see that for sure when you break down tape on him, very light on his feet, uh, looking to land kicks and whatnot. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, he has a, a a good amount of victories via submission. You take a look at his 16 wins, uh, 10 of them via submission. And I think that that's actually going to play, um, well, I shouldn't say it's going to play a big factor in this fight, but if, if things are going to go good for Weston, I think that that's the avenue he's going to want to go here because although he has that karate background and whatnot, uh, I have not been 
that impressed with what I've seen from him on tape. In fact, some of the tape I was watching on him, he got absolutely demolished and knocked out uh, against against when he excuse me when he was facing off against uh, Ishahira. Um, the uh, Team Alpha Male product, the Japanese fighter that used to fight in the UFC, who, uh, you know, no disrespect, but just really not on the level. You got a guy in Brito who's much more dangerous with his boxing. So, uh, you know, defensively, Wilson will have his hands down. And I very much favor the scenario that Brito is going to connect very heavily on the feet and probably get a knockout here. That's the route I'm going. I got, I got Brito uh, by knockout and probably early on too. I think Joe Anderson Brito comes... Comes at him very early and lands some big shots. So that's the route I'm going. Now, like I said, this was a newly added match to the card. So I don't have a betting line on this fight right now. Uh, but I'm telling you guys right now, Brito is going to be a big time favorite. Uh, if you're going to look to take him, maybe he's a parlay piece. I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Uh, or you look for the under and for the, the knockout prop uh, on Brito there. I really do believe that he's going to be doing some damage uh, in this fight here against uh, Weston Wilson. And uh, Wonder Boy probably will be in, in Wilson's corner and whatnot, but that won't be enough to have him hanging around with Brito here, in my opinion. So, uh, you know, I, I won't go to, on too much more about this fight. Um, you know, and Wilson, even though he's making his debut, this is a guy that had has really high hopes as far as how far he wanted to push his career in the sport of MMA, but he's already 34 years old. Uh, he's, he's the taller fighter by almost five inches, uh, but only has uh, about a one-inch reach advantage. I think Brito... We'll have no problem closing that distance and land some big shots with his hands. In the bantamweight division, we got Yana Santos, the wife of Tiago Santos, taking on Carol Rosa. Now, Santos was initially supposed to be taken on Macy Chason. In steps Carol Rosa on short notice, somewhat of short notice here. Uh, Carol Rosa uh, coming off a tough loss against Norma Dumont. That was a fight uh, where the betting line was very close going into the fight. Uh, you know, I did side with Rosa there. Uh, and again, she took that L, uh, but she finished that fight pretty strongly. She took the third round. Um, you know, she's a fighter that is decently well-rounded. She does some things well, but just seems to come up short in some of the the bigger opportunities that she gets. Um, you know, <laughs> might might be shooting myself in the foot, giving her another opportunity here. But I am going to pick her against Yana Santos. I just haven't I haven't really ever been that impressed with what I've seen from Yana Santos. I like her toughness. She's definitely a chick that that will bring the fight and she's not uh, scared to get a little bit bloody and whatnot. but coming off a loss to Holly Holm uh, was knocked out against Irene Aldana uh, before that. I know those are both big names in the game, but we saw how Aldana just froze up in her big opportunity and Holly Holm's up there in age uh, before that took out Ketlin Vieira and Georgia Storlienko. Uh I really don't like the way that she was finished by Aspen Ladd and the way that she was landed on in that fight. She was very bloody. Speaking of her not being scared to get bloodied up, I mean, she was bloodied up against Aspen Ladd there. Uh, I'm just not really overwhelmed with the victories that she's had in the octagon. I guess you could say Ketlin Vieira is, is her big victory there. Uh, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Carol Rosa one more opportunity here. She's still only 28 years old. She's a well-rounded fighter. I'm going to say she picks up uh, off that that third round that, that she won against Norma Dumont and starts to finally pick things up a little bit here. And I think she could take out Yana Santos uh, in this match here. Not a lot going on as far as um, how they physically match up. They're very similar. Santos with the one-inch reach. She's one inch taller, but uh, Carol Rosa is, is uh, she's, she's not a small fighter for the division. Number ninth ranked bantamweight against the number sixth, sixth ranked bantamweight in Yana Santos. I will slightly edge Carol Rosa, uh, but we'll take a look at, at we'll take a look at the betting line. Carol Rosa opened up as a minus two ten on Bet US. She's now a minus one ninety, so it seems that the line is somewhat correcting itself because I don't think that Rosa should be a two to one favorite. With some of the performances that she's had, I mean, this fight has all the makings to play very closely. You know, Santos is tough, like I said, she'll be aggressive, she'll be bringing the fight. This could be a fight that, or I favor this fight to be a fight that goes to the judges' scorecards, and I could see it playing out closely, but I think that Rosa gets the nod in a close fight here, potentially a split decision, or she does enough to finally solidify two rounds uh, You know, this time around instead of being on the other side of the fence where she she only solidifies the one round. Give me Carol Rosa there. In the lightweight division, in steps Guram Kutatatlazi. Excuse me on that name, and that one's just a tough one. I know some of you guys love to go on the attack in the comment section about my pronunciations, but that's one that I could practice over and over. Listen to how they say it. It just gets me, man. Uh, the Georgian Viking Guram, uh, and it's a name that I really need to get comfortable saying because I, I really expect big things coming from him in the near future. He's taking on Elves Brenner, who's coming off a huge victory in his UFC debut uh, where he pulled off the, ep the upset 
uh, against uh, Zubara uh, Tukigov. Uh, Elvis, only 25 years old, fighting out of uh, Team Shootbox, training with guys like Thomas Almeida, Ch of course, Charles Oliveira, uh, the, the biggest name coming out of uh, the, their camp over there. Um, I mean, listen, he pulled off the upset against uh, Zubara there. You know, that was one of those fights that, I'm going to tell you, man, we've been seeing these type of performances more frequently as of recently. There's these performances by some of these fighters where something seems to be off with them, right? It's one thing if you go out there and get beat, but some of these fighters seem like they're not giving it their all in the cage as of recently. I'm telling you, I don't know if you guys have been noticing that uh, sometimes. And not to take anything away from Brenner's performance because he obviously showed up. He's a well-rounded fighter. I, I think he's an accurate striker and, and this and that. But uh, I thought that Zubaro could have did a lot more in that fight. Uh, to to take that there, but he didn't. Uh, now Brenner getting a a another very tough task in front of him, and uh, if you ask me, obviously it's a major step up for, from Zubara. I mean, I think that this this guy Guram, the Georgian Viking, is very legit. Uh, we saw him take out, uh, shouldn't say take out, but squeak by in a split decision victory uh, against Mateus Gamrat, who we have a lot of respect for. In his last fight, he arguably could have won that fight against uh, Demir Ismagulov. That was a very close fight. Uh, you know, so maybe he shouldn't have got the nod against Gamra, but maybe he should have got the, the nod against Demir Ismagulov. Either way you want to spin it, we're talking about uh, a bunch of very talented men, and he's showing the, the level that he's on. Uh, you see him training with Kamzat Shemaev. We know that these guys train together extensively. Kamzat Shemaev, talent, forget about it. You guys know the deal with that. So, um, Guram is a very well rounded fighter. I think he could have uh, the edge. Uh, in the grappling department here uh, on on the feet. I think you'll have the edge there as well, but um, I would like to see him changing levels, uh, look, looking to throw Brenner around a little bit and just uh, go out there and, and put it on him. Um, he'll have that that grown man strength here. He's a 31-year-old alpha male, and I'm not talking about team alpha male. I'm talking about just a straight alpha. This guy's an alpha right now. He's cruising into the prime of his career, and then you got Elvis Brenner who's still has a lot to learn at 25 years old and he's in the right spot, right? He's learning from the right people, but I just don't think the time is now for him to hang with a guy like Guram. Utatalazi, they like that there. Um, so yeah, I will take Guram and uh, you know, Guram was supposed to be fighting not too long ago against uh, Jamie Malarkey. That fight fell through. So, I mean, he, he's been prepping for a big time fight uh, and I think that he starts to catch that momentum that's very much deserved when you take a look at the skill level of him. So, yeah, I'm on Guram here. Uh, let's take a look at the betting line. Uh, over at BetUS, he opened up as a minus 400. He's now a minus 500. We're talking about a big-time favorite here. Uh, if you guys want to get greedy, you want to get crazy, another parlay piece potentially. Um, I mean, you're going to want you, you're gonna want, want it to have already grabbed it early probably because by the time you're listening to this, he might be a minus 600. I mean, things that might be a little bit of a crazy line if you ask me. Again, uh, don't think that Brenner is a slouch. Again, he he showed up in his UFC debut, and he has the potential to show up here and make this fight somewhat competitive. I wouldn't be shocked, but if he gets his hand raised, I wouldn't say I would be shocked, but I would be pretty damn surprised. You break down tape. I mean, I'm high on Guram. Give me Guram. Get the job done. Unanimous decision for Guram here. The big boys are throwing down. We go up to the heavyweight division where we got Alexander Romanov taking on Blagoy Ivanov. Goy Ivanov, a.k.a. Pluto from Popeye, looking to be aging a little bit over the last couple of years, but still only 36 years old and about as tough as it gets. I mean, you guys all know the stories about him getting shanked right there, right right in the middle too, right under his sternum, right getting shanked. I think that's where the spot was. You see the scar. Uh, we know that he was in a coma. Uh, you, you know the mental toughness this guy has. He, goes, he loses all this weight, loses like 100-something pounds, and then he works his way right back into the sport of MMA. Just never uh, having any type of thoughts about, about uh, taking a step away. I mean, he, he was back relatively quickly. Uh, you, you know the stories about him defeating Fedor Emelianenko in, in uh, combat Sambo matches, which back in the day, I mean, that, that was just uh, something that was seemed to be unheard of, just defeating Fedor in any type of way. Uh, he's an extremely tough fighter. And, uh, you know, and then you got a guy in Romanov who has really been struggling as of recently, the number 14th ranked uh, heavyweight. A fighter that was so hyped up, uh, but you take a look at his last two performances against uh, Marcin Tybura and Alexander Volkov, and I know they're against uh, talented fighters, both those fighters, upper echelon fighters in the division, but it's the way that he lost both of those fights. And if you want to take it a step further, 
when you remember the, the performance that he had against Juan Espino, the talented Spaniard wrestler, we saw him gas out and break down in that fight. That was a fight that he should have lost. And you guys remember, there was some funny business that went on there because the first round started for a couple of seconds. They went to the judges' scorecards. They judged that round. And somehow uh, there, was some, there was some funny business. Let's just put it at that, right? Uh, I believe that he actually uh, did get the W there. He did get the W. He should have lost that fight. Uh, but that, that's when we knew that he's a bully. And he's a fighter that, that doesn't like to be bullied, right? He's a fighter that likes to be the hammer. He does not want to be the nail. He doesn't take take kindly to being the nail at all. And then when you're facing off against a guy like Blagoy, who, you know, throughout his UFC career has showcased a 70% takedown defensive rate, I think that he's going to make Romanov work. Uh, and even if Romanov gets that initial takedown in the first round and does damage, if he doesn't get the finish and this fight goes to the second and third rounds, I think that we could easily start to see Blagoy marching forward with that, that very stiff uh, grandpa type of striking and then the southpaw stance. And you know we could see him peppering uh, Romanov up. Uh, and we know Blagoy's put an extensive amount of time over at uh, Team AKA throughout the years. So, I mean, you know the level of training uh, to go along with his mental toughness. I mean, it's, it's been... Phenomenal. And, uh, you know, you, you always see him brushing shoulders with some of the greats in the game, man. You see him here with Roy Nelson, but he's just, he's always brushing shoulders with some of the big names and the big wigs. And uh, he's a guy that's very determined to get his hand raised every time he goes out there. He's going to give you a run for your money. He's not going to be a fighter that, that quits, quits on you, which again, I talked about that earlier. That's something that we've been seeing a lot recently. These fighters are showing up and listen, it's easy for me to sit here uh, you know, in my office here on, on the chair and talk about these fighters quitting and whatnot. But you guys know what I'm talking about. I'm holding them to a higher standard because these are supposed to be some of the toughest men on, on planet Earth. I mean, these guys are, are MMA fighters fighting in the greatest promotion in the world in the UFC. And when, when some of these guys do that, we're going to put them to the fire. Romanov has been one of those guys that has seemed to be a little bit of a quitter and has seemed to be a guy that's not refining his cardio and whatnot properly, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I just can't back him. I can't back him against a, a proven veteran uh, in uh, Blagoy Ivanov. So we take a look uh, once again at BetUS where Alexander Romanov opened up as a minus 145. Not necessarily shocked there. It seems the line is correcting itself. He's now a minus 120. Uh, you know, Romanov just has been very hyped up throughout the last couple of years and then comes in at points in time with, with a very, very heavy line behind his name. But give me Blagoy Ivanov here again. He showcased good takedown defense. We know he has the Sambo background. He keeps this fight standing. Uh, it makes Romanov work hard, and Romanov doesn't like it. And uh, I'm going to say Blagoy takes a decision just because, you know, he, I think that they, they wear in each other and they're kind of gassed and he just peppers them up. But the finish is very likely as well in the second and third rounds because Romanov will fade. Uh, he will fade, and he might look for a way out. You know, we saw him get finished very early against Alexander Volkov too. He might even fade extremely early. He doesn't have success with that takedown. He, can, he might just uh, check out once again. So give me Blagoy Ivanov to get the job done there. Kevin Lee, the Motown phenom, makes his return to the octagon. I'm, I'm happy to hear that, right? Uh, you see him getting it in with uh, Gilbert Burns here too. Seems like he's surrounding himself with uh, the, the right people for sure. Team Kill Cliff, uh, that, that's a great move for him. Um, you know, We'll get back to Kevin Lee in a second. He's taking on Renat Fakrak Dinov. Uh, who had a, a very solid UFC debut where he went out there and took out Brian Battle, a fighter that I'm very high on. You guys know I'm high on Battle. Uh, we've seen time and time again that he is a legit fighter, and he didn't look that legit when he was taking on uh, Fakradinov. So that shows you the level that, that he's on. Uh, Fakradinov securing 100% of his takedown attempts within that fight, showing his grappling. Uh, you know, he has some power in his strikes as well. I think that he's just a very tough fighter. The, the, the nickname, the Gladiator, very fitting. And, um, you know, we'll jump back to Kevin Lee. Kevin Lee, you know, a fighter that I used to love to watch perform back in the day, man. When, when he was a young and upcoming fighter, if you guys remember him, because he got into the UFC very early, this was a fighter that I used to look to and say, oh, imagine him down the line when he hits his prime. I mean, he was such a talented fighter. He, had, he has the wrestling background, explosive striking, phenomenal athlete, um, you know, but, but things went downhill for him. And I do believe, I, I want to make sure I word this properly because it's not really a knock on him. I, you know, it's nothing. Let me just say it like this. I do believe that there's been some mental issues with Kevin Lee. And, and I don't mean that in a bad way uh, as far as just like in the day-to-day -day life. As far as being a UFC fighter though, I think that mentally he's not really there. And I think there's a reason why his career kind of went downhill. 
I think that he's a fighter that that enjoys himself out of the cage. Uh, and I don't mean that he's just like a party or just sitting there drinking every night, but I think he's a guy that, that looks into uh, different things in, in life. Not just He's not just a guy that's just in the cage uh, or in the gym just training nonstop. And I think that we saw a little bit of that in his decline. Uh, losses to uh, Ally Quinta. He got finished by Rafael Dos Anjos in that fight in the fourth round. Uh, he had the, the big-time knockout victory against Gregor Gillespie where he hit him with the head kick early on. Uh, he was lucky that Gillespie didn't get his paws on him and, and uh, looked to, to drag him in the deep waters. Was submitted by Oliveira, which doesn't look that bad these days. I wasn't that impressed with what I saw from him in the D-Rod fight. And then, honestly, I wasn't that impressed with what I saw from him, most importantly, in his last fight against Diego Sanchez. Even in that victory, uh, I thought that it was a very low-level MMA fight. You take a look at, at how Diego Sanchez has, has been looking up until this point in time or around that point in time. And, and I just think that if you were to throw a guy like Renat Fakhradinov in the cage with with uh, Diego Sanchez at that point in time, I think Renat just absolutely demolishes him. And Kevin Lee actually let that fight play out uh, to a decision. I mean, he was just, you know, kind of out there working. And uh, you know, I don't know if I want to say Sanchez had his moments in that fight, but I just wasn't impressed with the performance by Kevin Lee. And I'm just not... Sure, I, I could bank on him returning to the vintage form of, of what a Kevin Lee once was. Um, I don't want to point fingers and say that he was on performances, uh, uh, excuse me, PEDs or something like that back in the day, but he just seemed to be a different fighter back in the day. Maybe I'm being a little harsh on him. Again, I, I love I love me some Kevin Lee, man. I really hope that he shows up here and looks to be the best version that we've ever seen from him. He's only 30 years old. There's no reason why we shouldn't be seeing the best version of Kevin Lee. But again, when you see a guy going into his prime ages and you see him looking worse and worse fight to fight, that to me is alarming. And I like the fact that he's training over at Team Killcliffe and all that, but I'm not going to bank on us seeing all, uh, uh, excuse me, of, for us to just see a, a complete turnaround here and we see Kevin Lee back on track. I'm just, I'm not going to bank on it. And then when it all boils down, uh, Renat Fakhradinov is just a very talented fighter, so I think he's going to have trouble with the pace and the wrestling of, of Renat here, and I think that Renat's going to drag him into the deep waters, and he's going to control this fight. Uh, Renat right now is a, he opened as a minus 250 favorite on my bookie, and he's now a minus 232, so a little bit of action coming towards Kevin Lee's way. That could be due to the fact that people are talking about him taking this fight very seriously, training with the right people and whatnot. Uh, but but I wouldn't bank on that personally. I think that even if you're getting a plus 180 line, I think that's just a little little bit of a, a steep expectation to have for him to just show back up to the octagon and look to be in phenomenal fashion because he will need to be in phenomenal fashion if he's going to take up Renat. Give me Renat Fakhradinov. I'll take him by most likely a decision, but I wouldn't be surprised if he breaks Kevin Lee uh, in the second round, third round, and, and drags him into those deep waters down on the mat and maybe pulls off uh, some type of sub. I wouldn't be shocked there. Uh, six submission victories throughout his 21 fights there. Uh, eight KOs for, for Renat too. So again, he does have some power. Maybe we see a TKO. Maybe he puts it on Kevin Lee in the second or third round. I think it would happen a little bit later on. I think that Kevin Lee may struggle mentally in this fight if things don't go his way early on. Like I, like I said, a little bit of a head case. Kevin Lee will have that three-inch reach advantage. We know he has a great wingspan for his height. Renat's taller, but the three-inch wingspan for Kevin Lee. It's not really all, all too worried about all that. Give me Renat to get the job done. I think that he shows up here. And hopefully Kevin Lee gets another opportunity, maybe against a, a little bit of a lower-level opponent, and he could look to build on his confidence in the octagon. Or I would hope so. Still only 30 years old. But if he can get his head right, I think that he still can potentially hang around. Ivana Petrovic taking on Luana Karolina. Ivana Petrovic looks to make her UFC debut here. The former Cage Warriors and Aries champion. She's 6-0 and as a pro. She's undefeated. You could pull up a couple of her fights on YouTube. Seems to be a fighter that is decently polished up. Uh, he's a southpaw. Striking is okay. Not a lot of quickness and pop to it, but it's decently technical. And down on the mat, I mean, she has... a. a Good amount of submission victories. Uh, half of her wins coming by, or excuse me, two of her uh, six victories coming by way of submission. Three of them coming by way of KO slash TKO. And uh, a lot of those were down on the mat using her ground and pound and whatnot. Controlling her opponents, dropping elbows and then bloodying them up. Um, I mean, she seems to be a decently polished fighter coming into her debut here. Um, not a lot of explosiveness in her striking, like I said, though. I mean, this isn't like a... a a whirlwind type of fighter that's that she's going out there and just you know dancing around styling on her opponents i mean she's kind of plotting forward but 
she she's moving moving around like she knows what she's doing. Uh, you guys know the deal with Luana Carolina, um, 30 years old. She's a, a big girl for the division, very rangy. Although in this fight here, she'll actually be uh, at a two-inch reach disadvantage against Ivana. Uh, and Ivana will actually almost be two inches taller than her as well. So Ivana, a very rangy fighter for the division. Luana coming off two losses in a row, 30 years old. She's essentially cruising into the prime of her career, coming off losses against Joanne Wood and Molly McCann. We know that the Lupi Garinas victory was a big one for her. She used her size in that fight to squeak that one out. The victory over Pollyanna Botello. Um, before that, she was submitted by Ariane Lipsky with that knee bar, I think, very early on. So uh, Luana Carolina, she's a she's a tricky fighter. Um, she does possess some skill, and she definitely is live to show up here and pull off a W uh, in a, a flyweight match where you really... Don't know exactly what to expect against a girl in Ivana Pedrovic, a girl who's coming in fighting very low-level talent outside the UFC as well. So this is going to be a step up in competition for Ivana for sure. I definitely believe that Luana is the steepest competition that she's ever faced. And uh, you know what? She opened up as a minus 263 favorite on my bookie. She's now a minus 238. That line should be trending that way because I think that that's a very steep line uh, for Ivana. On Ivana in a spot like this, where you know a flyweight women's mixed martial arts fight, where we haven't seen her battle tested before. Luana Carolina has been in the octagon a good amount of times now. That line should correct itself. I think that Ivana should be like a minus 170, 160 favorite, if that. You know what I mean? But I, but I will side with her just based on the fact that she's shown some real toughness too. You break down some of her tape, and she's gone to war. And uh, I will take her to get the job done there, uh, even though I think that that line is a little steep, if you ask me. Now, this fight will be a treat taking place in the middleweight division. Bruno Ferreira taking on Neural Sultan uh, Ruzi Boyov, the Uzbeki fighter, who's only 29 years old, even though he has uh, 42 professional fights. He's stepping in on short notice. Initially, Abdul Razak al Hassan was supposed to be taking on Bruno. How awesome would that have been to be able to witness that fight? Two guys that just go out there and look to take their opponent's heads off. Uh, but this guy, R Rosie Boyov, is a very fun fighter as well. And I'm excited to see this matchup here. Uh, if if you have not seen uh, the fight between Nur Sultan and, excuse me here, I'm going to pull it up for you, uh, Ibrahim Main, if you have not seen this fight that took place over at Brave 47, you need to go pull this fight up. It's on YouTube. You can easily access this fight. I almost don't even want to tell you guys what happens if you haven't seen it yet, just so you can be surprised as it happens. But I guess I kind of have to. The majority of you probably won't pull it up. So we see that that rampage a type slam where, where his opponent was trying to put him in a triangle and submit him and Rosie Bob slammed him on his neck. It, the angle that he put him out on was ridiculous, completely flatlined his opponent. Rosie Boyov is a fighter that has good submission skills. I mean, you take a look at his 34, 34 pro wins, 16 of them by submission. Now here's the, the uh, question mark I have on Rosie Boyov. He's a fighter that looks to be in phenomenal shape, very shredded, good, good frame on him, but he fought a lot of low level fighters throughout his career. Now, he's fought some, some decent competition as of recently and, and scattered throughout his resume, but a lot of his victories are against very low-level opponents. And he, there's some losses that are against lower-level opponents as well, right? We're talking about a guy that's lost eight times. Some of those eight losses, take a look at the, the opponent, and I'm not too high on them. Now, Bruno Ferreira, he started off, you know, we only have 10 fights to talk about. We see he started off his pro career fighting some lower-level fighters too, but in his last five fights, uh, he's been fighting some some decent competition. We already talked about the Gregory Rodriguez knockout. Once again, showcasing that he just ha is a precision striker that has dynamite uh, in his hands and just he's an absolute knockout artist. And I have to side with him here. Now, I, I am taking him to get another first-round knockout in this fight. I've seen some defensive flaws on the feet from Rosie Boyov. He's also a fighter that if you kind of bombard and rush in on, he, he will fall to his back. He's, he's kind of confident in his guard and whatnot. But I think that that can be an issue for him too. I think that uh, Bruno will be the Hulk in this fight. I think that he'll be the stronger fighter. He'll be kind of going forward. But there's a big question mark. If Bruno doesn't get that knockout and this fight goes deep into the into the fight, to the late rounds, late in the second, to the third round, which it will be very late for him, how will Bruno look in those in those rounds? Right. You have a guy uh, in Nur Sultan who is, even though not he hasn't been fighting the most stiff of competition, he has so much cage time. He has so much ring time. He's been in there for, for a lot longer than a guy like Bruno. I think that he might be more composed and also favor his, his ground game from what we've seen so far. 
Although I'm not even really sure about that, but maybe I'll give the edge to the, to the ground game of the Uzbeki fighter. Um, but yes, I am going to take the Hulk to get that that knockout victory in this spot here. I just how can I how can I doubt him? You know, after the performance that he had in Dana White's Contender Series, the UFC debut that he just had, I think that he gets the knockout here. I'll, I'll side with him there, and uh, it should be a very fun fight. Let's go take a look at the betting line. Um, now, this was a fight that was put together uh, very recently as well, so we, we're, we're not going to have a line on this fight actually either. I do not believe. Uh, so we don't. We don't have a line on this fight as of now. I'm expecting Bruno to settle in maybe as like a 240, 230 favorite. Uh, let's see if I'm wrong on that or, or whatnot, but I, I do believe he will be the favorite here. And uh, he was a minus 165 favorite in his initial matchup with Abdul Razak al -Hassan. I have a feeling that there would have been a little bit more respect in Abdul's name. So yeah, I think Bruno will settle in right around that 240 range or something like that. Maybe that's where the, the line should be. You're going to want to target the knockout prop, the, the unders, you know, the, those types of things here. I think Bruno does the, uh, the Hulk smash thing once again. So you guys know I've been very high on the Bonfim brothers. Got one of them throwing down here, Ismael Bonfim, the older brother of the Bonfims taking on Benoit St. Denis, both only 27 years old though. These fighters really have a lot of prime years ahead of them. And, and that's exciting because both of the, these fighters have already have show, showcased what they're about. I'm high on Benoit St. Denis as well. Uh, a good striker, a fighter that has showed to be extremely tough. You know, I, I think that a lot of fighters in the welterweight and lightweight divisions are, are not really chomping at the bit to be matched up with any of the Bonfim brothers. Uh, but, but I wouldn't, categorize a guy like Benoit St. Denis uh, as one of them. I think that he's extremely tough. I mean, when he went to war uh, with Zaleski Dos Santos, I mean, he absolutely showcased what he's about in that fight. Uh, I mean, a lot of other fighters would have broke down early on and he just continued to march forward, bloodied up. I think his nose broke and whatnot. I mean, he just continued to march forward and he, he was landing that heavy body kick that he likes to land. He has a beautiful um, power body kick that he likes to smash in there. I think that he showcased that he's a fighter that's not lacking in the grappling department either. He's not a fighter that's just going to go out there and be taken down and ragdolled. He's a complete fighter. And th this is just an absolute uh, perfect matchup, I think, right now. Now, uh, Ismail Bonfim, uh, you know, he, in my opinion, may, may not be the more, uh, I guess I should, shouldn't really say it like that because I'm high on both the Bonfim brothers, but I am a little bit higher on Gabriel Bonfim. But I'm very high on Ismail as well. Uh, Gabriel fighting in the welterweight division. Both these guys, very, very technical with their striking, very well-rounded, great grappling. They do it all. And, uh, you know, and, and how do we see this fight taking place? Listen, from what I've seen for, from Ismail, I think that he's going to be quicker to the strike. Um, I think he's more diverse with his striking. He's v much more composed. He's seeing things in slow motion. Uh, he's just a more well-rounded fighter. I think he'll be a step ahead down in the mat as well. I think his jujitsu is a little bit more high caliber. And, uh, you know, the Bonfim brothers are just, they're, they're doing their thing down there, man. I think that uh, both of them have the potential, and I'm banking on them being the face of Brazilian MMA in, in the near future. Uh, they both got into the game extremely early. Uh, you know, Ismael Bonfim, 27 years old, uh, you know, had his pro debut back in 2011. So, I mean, you do the math, that's, that's 12 years ago. He had his pro debut uh, I mean, do the math there when he was a teenager, right? I mean, so he's just, the learning curve is crazy. He's 19 and three. And uh, I am taking Ismail Bonfim to get the job done here. Like I said, I think that he'll just be a little bit of a step ahead anywhere this fight goes. Even though I'm very high on Benoit St. Denis's toughness and all that, I think that he'll be a little bit more stiff. So he'll be favoring that, that, that power body kick and whatnot. And I just think that Ismail will just be more diverse with the striking. He'll be quicker. And I think that he gets the job done. Um, Anytime a Bonfim brother's in there, I mean, you, you can't really shy away from potentially seeing a finish. It's very likely. Uh, but Benoit St. Denis has showed his, his toughness and uh, coming off a, a uh, coming off two finishes in his own right too. Submitted Nicholas Stoles and uh, also knocked out Gabriel Miranda. Two lower level fighters, even though it was in the octagon. Had the loss against Aleski Dos Santos where he went to war. Showed his toughness and uh, he has never been finished. So kind of kind of tough to... Uh, to eye that, that finish there. Uh, I'm going to say Ismail Bonfim wins a decision here. And, and that's, you know, half of his victories have come by way of finish. But yeah, I will say that Benoit St. Denis 
does show his toughness once again, and he survives here. But I'm gonna I'm gonna take Ishmael Bonfim uh, in this spot. I, I have to. You guys know I'm high in them. Um, on my bookie, Ishmael opened up as a minus two fifty six favorite, a very high line, and action is coming in on him as we speak. He's now a minus two seventy. Was a two seventy seven just a little bit ago. So action coming in on him. Don't be surprised if we see him settle in as a minus three hundred favorite, something like that. Uh, the hype is real on the Bonfim brothers, and I think it's warranted. They are very talented. Very fun to watch. You got the Ecuadorian, Michael Morales, only 24 years old. What a stud this kid is. Taking on Max Griffin. You know, Michael Morales, coming off his victory on Dana White's Contender Series, he was the underdog going into that match. He was fighting a true veteran, a tough Russian. And Michael Morales showcased his overall skill set in a major way. This is a fighter that is, uh, I believe he was part of the Team Ecuadorian Wrestling national wrestling team his striking has looked phenomenal i mean how about the performances that he's had so far in the ufc it's coming off two knockout victories in a row over trevin giles and adam fuget adam forget about it um you know two 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 scrappy fighters two two respectable opponents right um i mean you see the length that he has he's gonna have a three inch reach advantage here you know i remember after his performance on Dana White's Contender Series, you know, Dana White was talking about him having the potential to be like a, a, a prodigy in the sport, like the Michael Jordan of the UFC, kind of just throwing that out there. I thought that that statement was ridiculous at the time. I thought, ah, you know, he showed up on the night, but I mean, wow, that, those are some real bold claims. I mean, after the two performances that he just had in the octagon, it's clear to me that Dana White had a better perspective uh, on, on Michael Morales than me. There, there's obviously a buzz about him behind the scenes and people know what he the type of skill he possesses and i'm really excited to see how far he could push it he's just an absolute stud a stud of a fighter and then you got a guy max griffin who's really been thriving uh, late in his career he's 37 years old now and he's been thriving as of recently he's still getting the job done time and time again and you take a look at what he's been doing as of recently uh you know coming off a victory against tim means had the decision loss to neil magny uh victories over carlos condit Song Kanan, that was a big victory for him. Kenan Song, where he had the knockout victory there. Uh, knocked out Ramiz Brahimaj, ripped his ear off his face. But then losses to Alex Oliveira, Alex Morono, Alex, uh, Tiago Alves back in the day, Curtis Millinder, uh, you know, Zalim Amadayev, that was a, an ugly fight. Remember Zadim, Al, uh, Zalim Amadayev, that guy was talking all that crap. He was a nutcase and never had the skill set really to even be worthy of fighting in the octagon. But you know, had the victory over Mike Perry. I mean, listen, if you ask me, Max Griffin has a, a very interesting resume because he has notable names on his resume, but I mean, catching these fighters late in their careers and uh, some questionable losses as well. I mean, you know, those those middle of the pack type of names, the Alex Oliveira, Alex Morono, uh, an age, Tiago Alves, Curtis Millinder, you know, whatever. It, he wasn't able to cut in the UFC, didn't have the grappling. And, and um, you know, I, I do believe that Max Griffin has showcased his skill set. He's an awesome dude, and I think that he has had the benefit of some good matchmaking, but he's a guy that could really go out there and land a big shot on you, so don't underestimate him. But overall, I mean, this is Michael Morales all day. Michael Morales is going to have the cleaner striking. Uh, it's going to be much more polished. Uh, he's going to have the wrestling edge, and uh, and then you're going to see Max Griffin doing his little giraffe syndrome. You know how he's all lengthy, and he's, he's, do, he's on the baby giraffe legs, and he's wobbling, but he kind of possums you into landing a big straight too, right? So... Uh, I mean, do not underestimate him. He's dangerous, but this is Michael Morales all day. And, uh, you know, as rangy as Max Griffin is, Michael Morales with the three-inch reach advantage, an inch taller, and will have the wrestling edge as well. Uh, Michael Morales all day here. And, and let's see what kind of line we're talking about here. Michael Morales right now is a minus 222. Opened up as a minus 217 on my bookie, so slight movement going his way. A little surprised. I thought maybe we would see him already in that minus 270, 280 range. Keep an eye on this line. I think I, I do expect to see action coming in on Michael Morales continuously, and I think it will it'll start to creep up. So monitor the line, and if you're on Morales as another parlay leg, I think that this card has a lot of parlay legs. I think a lot of these, these high favorites are going to come through, in my opinion. So kind of note that. You know, Michael Morales, though, to be the better fighter here. And Max Griffin hasn't been finished all the way dating back to his Colby Covington fight way back in the day. Uh, you know, it's, He's been shown to be a very durable fighter, but... Michael Morales might land some clean punches and, and potentially finish this fight second round. Two Brazilian flyweight fighters here. Arian Lipsky taking on Melissa Gatto. Nice matchmaking here. This one should be a fun one. Arian Lipsky, I do believe that she's becoming a better version of herself as of recently. She's still a relatively young fighter. She's still under 30. She's definitely had some, 
some disappointing performances, but she's also went out there and, sh and shined before uh, in her last fight uh, where she, she took out the, the Southpaw, Southpaw boxer. I thought that was probably the best performance of her career uh, against JJ Aldrich. I think you could argue that was probably her best victory. Not too high in the Mandy Bohm victory, even though Mandy just, uh, I believe Mandy just had a victory finally. Um, I mean, you, you can look to the Luana Carolina victory where she has snatched up the quick knee bar, showing some some submission skills down on the mat. Uh, but I would say that her striking is, is probably her bread and butter. You know, she's a Muay Thai fighter. But she's working on her overall craft. Melissa Gatto, more of a Brazilian jiu-jitsu player, a little bit of a frail fighter. She's kind of skinny. It's not really the most physically imposing and physically strong. We saw in her last fight, that she really struggled struggled with her takedown defense. And when, she's, when she wasn't able to pose a threat with her jiu-jitsu, she was controlled and kind of bullied in there uh, against uh, Tracy Cortez. Uh, we know Cortez is a tough wrestler, but that's something to take note of. Before that, Agato definitely having some impressive performances, kind of sneaking in the UFC. You know, she was under the radar, uh, came into her, her UFC debut, uh, where she knocked out Victoria Leonardo. And then uh, the Sajar Eubanks finish, where she had that up kick, I believe it was, to the, to the midsection. She got her with the, the front kick, the body, and Sajar Eubanks had that delayed reaction. And um, would have liked to seen more of a, 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 a nose for the finish, too, because when Gato heard her, she kind of just froze up. I would have liked to have seen her really have known that she landed that shot and go in and follow it up. And she kind of froze up and almost was like worried that she hit her with a low blow. It was kind of weird. Um, but Gato is a, a, uh, a fighter that does have uh, so some serious Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I would say. She's a scrappy striker, I guess we've seen. She's working on her striking. But you know what? I like what I've seen from Lipsky as of recently. I think that she's just surging a little bit more here. I think her confidence will be higher coming off the victory uh, as Magato's coming in off the loss and she maybe she's questioning herself a little bit. Maybe we see Arian Lipsky kind of bully Magato a little bit in the clinch and maybe she gets on top of her and could kind of control her. And just She's a little bit more physically uh, stronger. And that's what's going to lead me to take in Lipsky here. And again, trust me, I understand that Lipsky's had some very questionable performances. She's been finished. She's lost to some fighters that, that are really not the most respectable names. I mean, uh, depending on how you look at it, got knocked out by Priscilla Cochuera, uh, was knocked out by Matanda De La Rosa, knocked out by Anton Antonina Shevchenko. I mean, yeah, you recognize those names, but I mean, eh, you know, what do you think about that? I don't know. So yeah, I mean, Gato is live here to maybe land some type of kick to the midsection to hurt her, but give me Ariane Lipsky. And I'll say the values on her at the very least. She's a plus 135, or she opened as a plus 135 in my bookie. Action coming her way, as to be expected, because this line should close a little bit. She's a plus 128 as we speak on my bookie, as I'm filming this. And uh, we're about a week out from the fight, though, so we'll see how the line movement goes. I think that the line closes a little bit closer. I, I like Ariane Lipsky here. I think that she's starting to really cruise into her prime, 29 years old, and we'll see how that fight plays out. We got a top 15 matchup in one of the most stacked divisions in the UFC, a lightweight division. We got Demir Ismagulov taking on Grant Dawson, number 12 versus number 15. Both of these fighters, extremely promising. Now, Demir Ismagulov is coming off a loss, but obviously we understand it was against Armand Sarukian, who has the potential, without a doubt, to hold gold uh, down the line. So, I mean, we're talking about premier talent there. Before that, squeaked off that close uh, decision victory that we talked about earlier against the Georgian Viking and Guram. Very high level opponent there. Uh, victories over Rafael Alves, Tiago Moises, Joel Alvarez. Uh, if you ask me, those are all underrated victories. Those are those are sleeper type of names. Maybe not the biggest of names, but if you understand the level of talent of those guys, uh, th those are sleeper victories there. I expect Demir Ismagulov to be very hungry uh, coming off the loss that he just had. Uh, and then you got a guy in Grant Dawson uh, who is just extremely talented as well. Now, it's interesting, right? Grant Dawson made the move to American Top Team uh, a while back. Uh, you see him here calling out for the Patty Pimblett fight. We don't really care about that. But, you know, he made the move uh, to American Top Team. It's kind of interesting. It's almost like, like, like he saw the writing on the wall with, uh, with our old boy James Krause there. I thought that that was a very solid move. It was very interesting at the time because Grant Dawson really was the protege of James Krause. But like I said, I think he knew a little something, made the right move there. And uh, he's looked to be a better fighter since making that move. He's looked to have been a more diverse fighter. He's a better striker. And uh, we know he has the wrestling background and can push the pace like no other. Great cardio. We saw that when he bursted on the scene on Dana White's Contender Series, just like breaking records with the takedowns that he put in the cage in, in that fight. And, um, you know, 
I say all that, and he's very talented and all that, but you know, 19, one and one, a great resume. But he's had some questionable performances. Uh, Mark Madsen, the, the victory over him, I'm not that high on Mark Madsen. I know he was an Olympic caliber wrestler and all that, but uh, I'm not that high on Madsen. Jared Gordon, a tough dude, but not on the level of Ademir's Magulov. Uh, you know, the Leonardo Santos fight and the Ricky Glenn, I want to talk about those two fights here real quick. Um, you know, the Ricky Glenn fight, he got 10 aided by Ricky Glenn in the third round. That's how that fight became a draw. He got beat down in the third round. Now, interestingly enough, it went the other way in the Leonardo Santos fight. He was beaten up early on in that fight and then eventually uh, got, got that knockout at the very end of the fight in the third round with one second left. So he was on his way to losing that fight, or at least he should have been. You know how the judges are these days. You never really know. But, uh, you know, and, and both these fighters uh, have trained at American Top Team. Grant, Grant Dawson currently at American Top Team. Demir Ismagulov a fighter that has put in a lot of work with, with the American top team. So the team knows him. They know what he's about. And, um, you know, he, he's obviously not over there. Uh, they, they kind of uh, separated. I, I don't know if it was just for this fight or if that's something moving forward that we're going to see continuously. But Demir Ismagulov, a, a lightning quick striker. He's not necessarily a guy that goes out there and looks to take your head off, but he's very quick. He's very skilled, very polished, and uh, great, great takedown defense. Great, You know, he does everything very well. And, uh, you know, we could take a look at the numbers that these guys have been putting off in the UFC because we do have uh, a decent amount of uh, fight history on them to, to really see what we're talking about there. Demir Ismagulov uh, posting a 75% takedown defensive rate when he wants to keep the fight standing. And if he does want to keep it here, he has that type of potential. Uh, Grant has great wrestling. Uh, takedown accuracy only at a 34% rate, but he is a good grappler. And if he gets the fight down there, we've seen that his jiu-jitsu has really evolved as well. Maybe he can uh, threaten Demir down in the mat if he can get it there, try to, to get on a neck or something like that. But uh, I, I kind of favor the footwork, the quickness, and the takedown defense of Demir to keep it there. And then on the feet, I, I just, you know, I, I like Demir a little bit more so. I just think that he's... Maybe maybe he won't put as much power into his shots. Well, Grant Dawson will try to throw a heavy leg kick or a head kick up there or something like that and put a lot of oomph into his shots. And he's diverse with his striking as well. But I think that Demir is just a little bit quicker. And like I said, more and more polished. And I, and I favor him there. Uh, Demir scoring a 3.78 uh, strike landed mark per minute compared to the 3.12 of Grant being a little bit more active. We've seen that when we break down tape on him. Absorbed almost like virtually identical there. As Mike Goldberg once said, once said, both very defensively sound fighters. I just I favor Demir in this fight, and and I don't want to say I I favor him with an extreme amount of confidence because when you got a guy like Grant Dawson Dawson who's that talented, obviously he's always live and he's young and he's only 29 years old. So we're going to continue to see strides in his game over at American Top Team, and um, but I will I will pick Demir as Magulov. I think that he's hungry for a W coming off that tough loss to Armand Sarukian. Being in the cage with a guy like Armand only will make you better, win, lose, or draw. And give me Demir here. He opened as a minus 163 on my bookie. He's now a minus 151. So maybe the line correcting itself, it should be a fight that where the line is, is closer than, than seeing a minus 163 or minus 170. I think that type of line would be off on Demir. Um, so you keep an eye on that line. If you like Demir, you could potentially grab that before the fight kicks off. Maybe at some point in time, it hits that minus 135, 140 mark. Uh, people know that Grant Dawson's a solid fighter, so um, we'll see how that plays out. But give me Demir Ismagulov to win via unanimous decision and somewhat of a close fight. I'll say it plays out somewhat close. Grant will have his moments as well. Hey, guys, real quick, just want to let you guys know I appreciate all of your support as I'm behind the scenes putting in this work, man. You guys hitting that like button, subscribing to the channel, hitting up the comment section. It all means a lot to me, and I just wanted to say that. Uh, also, uh, if you guys are interested in working with me, you guys know you could always shoot me a message through social media or through email, MMAFortuneTeller at gmail.com. And um, if you guys are interested in my pricing, if you ever want to work with me for my official plays, you guys know I'm always here. Besides that, if you're looking to sign up for a new sports book, I will give you guys a bunch of free plays. I'll give you two free packages. If you sign up through my link to Bavada.lv, you'll get an added bonus to your account as well. So just a little side note there. All right, guys. And then in the main event, we got our boy Tarzan. Love him or hate him, you got to at least feel that he's somewhat entertaining. And you got to be excited for his fights because if you don't like him, you probably want to see him get knocked out uh, like we saw him get knocked out by Alex Pereira. Uh, interestingly enough, they actually did some training together leading up to this fight. Uh, Abbas Megamedov, the Dagestani fighter that has since, I believe, moved to Germany or whatnot. This is a fighter we've seen perform over in the PFL. Uh, he is without a doubt a fight finisher out of his 25 uh, victories, 11 knockouts, six subs, uh, had an absolutely amazing UFC debut 
where he landed a, a front kick to the chin, landed some big shots with his hands. Uh, he's a rangy fighter. He's a very, very dangerous guy. Um, you know, he can grapple as well. I mean, he's a well-rounded dude. Um, you know, when a lot of people saw the, uh, the, the matchmaking here for this headliner, a lot of people f were kind of questioning it. But, but I think that you guys will see time and time again that this dude, I guess, is a fun fighter. He's a fight finisher, and I think he'll carve out a name in the, in the UFC game pretty quickly here. Um, Abus, 32 years old, he's in the prime of his career, so the UFC, they're, they're not playing games with him, they're matching him right up with Tarzan, Sean Strickland, uh, we know, uh, is a very, very talented striker, an unorthodox striker, I mean, when you saw the work that he just put on Nazaruddin Amavov, taking that fight on short notice, and then seeing what Amavov was just doing to his teammate Chris Curtis, when you see what Strickland's about, uh, I thought that Strickland won the fight against Cannoneer, and when you saw how good Cannoneer just looked in his last fight, you understand how high level the, the striking matchup was in that fight he got knocked out against Alex Pereira he definitely made a mistake there we're talking world-class striking so I mean he's fighting the cream of the crop just defeated Jack Hermanson uh victories over Uriah Hall if you remember he absolutely beat down Uriah Hall a uh, knocked out Brendan Allen um uh, I mean victories over Christoph Jocko Jack Marshman Nordin Taleb um Strickland you know well, you know what Strickland does man great cardio he's gonna push the pace with his striking and um listen if Sean Strickland doesn't get knocked out but by the big-time power that Abus has, uh, I think that Strickland has the avenue to, to win this fight. I, I do believe that. I, I think that he can out-volume Abus possibly. Um, I think that he does also have to you know, keep this fight standing. I think that's where he wants to keep this fight. Uh, and he has showcased that he has a good takedown defense throughout the years. I mean, we could pull the number up there. Um, Throughout the years, I mean, scoring a 85% takedown defensive rate. Now, the numbers on the bus here, you can't really even look at them because it's just ridiculous. Scoring 22.11 uh, significant strikes, landing that many strikes per minute. Obviously, it's just because he was in the cage for such a limited amount of time and just put an onslaught on Dustin Stolzfus. Uh, Sean Strickland, a legit 5.76 strikes per minute. The volume is ridiculous. And uh, in a decision type of affair, it's really hard to go against a guy like Strickland, a fighter that's really surging and he's been preparing for this day. He's been training and going to war with some of the big names in the game over there. And, um, you know, I am going to take Sean Strickland. How do I pick against my boy Sean Strickland here? Um, but but I'm going to let you guys know right now that this dude, Abus, is a dangerous dude. And he's very live to, uh, to show up here and spoil uh, the party for his opponent in the octagon once again. I... I 100% believe that. So, I mean, let's go take a look at the betting line and then we can really see what we're talking about here. You know, Sean Strickland opened as a minus 181 favorite. He's now a minus 178 favorite. Slight movement going the other way over on my bookie. I I'm not crazy about that line. I'm not. I, I think this dude, a bus is dangerous and I'm not really favoring him, favoring Sean Strickland anywhere a high up in the minus one. 100s. I would like him more like a minus 135, 145. So you might want to monitor that line, see if it trends down that way. He's a minus 165 currently in Bavada. He opened as a minus 145 there. So the line going the opposite way in Bavada.lv. Um, so I, I think there will be potential to get Strickland around a 150, 145. If you like him, I think that's what you want. Um, otherwise, I think there's value in the dog here. Just a, a, a bus is a Rangy fighter that has a lot of tools in his arsenal. He have a two-inch reach advantage. He has fight-ending power. We know Strickland drops his hands at times. He's a little bit too willing to engage there. And we saw that in the Pereira fight. I wouldn't be shocked if he gets dropped or hurt in this fight. Um, but from a... This fight goes to the decision, and we see this fight play out. I like the volume of Strickland. He sees things pr pretty well, and he lands pretty well. So give me Sean Strickland, Tarzan, to win uh, a, a main event slot here. And I think that we will see Sean Strickland really pushing his way with the name recognition and all that towards the top of this division. Uh, you got a lot of big names in the mix right now. Brendan Allen, Jared Cannonier with another big victory. The middleweight may be starting to shake up a little bit. It's good to see some, some something going on there. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up. Hopefully you guys are wrapping it up. I throw that into my uh, parting message uh, on a serious note. A lot of my friends used to think that was cool and think that's funny not to do that, that not to do those types of things better be wrapping it up for a multitude of reasons my opinion the most important reason is you don't want to have a kid but with some woman that you barely know or someone that you're not really planning on doing that with so of course there's a lot of other reasons too stds and whatnot so make sure you guys are wrapping it up out there um listen ah, feels good anyway so just make sure you guys are uh being intelligent out there make sure you're not too reckless remember a message i leave you guys with a lot of times is Think maybe at a, a current 
period in your life. You don't really have nothing going on or nothing to live for. And you can get a little reckless in a variety of ways. Just remember that today is not necessarily the same as it's going to be moving forward. And if you're, if you're having positive spirits, you're going to have better things gravitate towards you as you move forward. So you can expect better things to come. And if you have this reckless mindset, some of these, some of these things that, that you do in a negative way will carry over with you. And they could be a little bit of a nuisance, like I said. So talked about the, the first thing I said, but a variety of ways, just make sure that you're making intelligent moves and making moves that you would make as if you had a lot, a lot to live for and a lot riding on you, right? And as if you're you're feeling great because if you don't feel great today, you're gonna feel great tomorrow. I'm telling you guys, just put that put that pos positive mindset out there, and good things will happen. All right, guys, signing out. Tell her. Uh -huh. Welcome to the show. This is the MMA fortune teller. Yeah. The MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller.